Welcome to another episode of 72 Pin Connector. Uh, this week we have Adam Jordan. Hey. Tom Webster. Hey. And myself, Eric Fine. So, how are you two doing this week? Good. Pretty good. Very good. How are you doing? Not too bad. Weather staying warm out west. I think I can get used to this. <laughs> yeah, it was snowing today. Yeah, it snowed today for the first time. Oh, that sucks. Yeah, I was... It was um, 80. 80 degrees yesterday. I was able to, you know, walk into the <laughs> office without a coat all week and, you know, just walk around during lunch oh, yeah. a little bit. Ah, oh, so nice. <sighs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, West Coast sorry. Indians. Yeah. Uh, so what kind of games you guys been playing this week? Um, well, I have been... Uh, playing pokemon fire red because classic pokemon games and you know getting in the mood for sun and moon coming out um so hopefully i will have that shortly uh so fire red is awesome as usual um i did play uh grim fandango uh which i i can talk a little bit about i'd like to play a little bit more before i pass harsh judgment but it's got a lot of the classic adventure game problems where there's a lot of pixel hunting. There's stuff that doesn't really make logical sense where you use, you know, cat hair mustaches and it just, it, that doesn't literally happen, but it's stuff like that where it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, I have never straight played go. a minute. Really? Never even touched it. Okay. Well, it's, if you've played any adventure game, by LucasArts or Double Fine. It kind of feels like that, but it was right on the transition from their 2D to 3D adventure games, and it it really suffers because of that. There was an issue where they bolted on touch controls afterwards, like point-and-click standard adventure game controls instead of this <laughs> weird tank mode 3D thing, and I clicked outside of a... or I clicked a door to go out... But because of a bug in the system, the main character would sit in the doorway right before the trigger where it switches the camera. Mm -hmm. So there was no way I could actually get him outside of the door without actually resorting to using the, the horrible, you know, uh, up wasted controls that they bolted onto this thing. <laughs> it was it was not good. Sounds um, and then uh, accounting. And uh, that was for the Vive, um, which I thought was interesting is a neat little experiment thing it wasn't great i don't think i'll go back to it uh and then um, google earth vr which i will put a lot of time into it was amazing so um you're gonna go back to accounting because i guarantee you missed something Probably. or a couple things i i recently ran through that um there's some easter eggs in there that are pretty interesting like what you can huh. do after you beat the game if you go back and retrace your steps when you started the game, you'll find something. Something kind of shocking. It's like, oh shit, what's that doing there? Oh. And you do a special something with the thing, and yeah, stuff happened. Well, and other things. <laughs> the things with the dude with the dad. Yeah. So I'll, I'll have to, if you're a fan of Rick and Morty and, and that style of humor, uh, give accounting a shot. Uh, if you've got a Vive, I mean, I know the Venn diagram just got like really small when I added that caveat, but <laughs> you know, it's, it's free. You don't pay for it. Just go out and grab it. And, uh, it's, it's a good time for a little bit. I'll just let you guys tell me all about that. I promise you, <laughs> it's Adam, it's amusing. Um, but, uh, Google earth VR, absolutely amazing. Uh, yeah. seriously it's not i was thinking ah it's it's google earth and vr but they've got these tours where they google has meticulously modeled very sparse certain very popular areas of the world like the you know golden gate bridge tokyo tower paris eiffel tower um where they've actually put in detailed 3d models of these uh monuments and they can give you tours with sounds and music playing behind them it's absolutely amazing and nothing makes you feel like a superhero more than like standing on your childhood street as a kid and then hitting the button to like superman fly up in the air and fly all around your hometown and then go to outer space it's pretty cool nice. but that's about it for me uh except for the topic we'll talk about later <laughs> what topic is that the witness there's a lot to discuss oh, on that so i'll just say i have been playing the witness <laughs> I have also been playing The Witness. 
Um, God, I love that game. And I've been playing Rocket League. And that's about it. Yeah. It's pretty close to that for me. Uh, got into Rocket League, did some Witness. Accounting was fun. Um, like Tom said, Rick and Morty-esque humor. It's a story game. Last, maybe, if you know what you're doing, you can get through it in five minutes. But to enjoy it the first time through, probably take you a good 30, 40 minutes. But it's free, might as well. And um, I, ex for the first time, used Amazon uh, release day shipping for Pokemon Sun and Moon. For those nice. of you who are Prime members and have never done this, I highly recommend it. Uh, you pre-order or order a game that was released in the last two weeks on Amazon. You get, it's physical media, you get 20% off automatically. And if you pre-order it, like I pre-ordered four days before it came out, it arrived the day of release. So 20% discount, day of release, and you get the physical copy. It's really solid program, and um, about an 40 minutes into Pokemon, got too sidetracked with going for Rising Star in Rocket League. <laughs> How close How are you Pokemon? Um, so far, um, there's no gems in this one. I don't think it's a spoiler. It was kind of public knowledge. Um, they have oh. these weird island trial things they're going for. Um, I haven't started one. Don't quite know what it's going to be. Uh, the starting Pokemon, uh, you have like this kind of weird looking owl that has a leaf bow tie. That's a grass type. You got this fire cat, which I think has some uh, chance to be something really cool because the whole fire cat thing could get big and awesome. Kind of like the pair to RK9. And then there's this weird seal thing that I haven't seen in fight or anything, but it just looks weird. So, yeah, I'm with Firecat. Sounds like Pokemon. Yeah, pretty much. Um, Pokedex, um, kind of the same. When you catch a Pokemon, it actually immediately tells you how many evolutions it has. So there's no wondering or looking up, well, I'm at level 30 with this Pokemon. Am I going to get another evolution? When's it? So you'll know, okay, you've already maxed the evolutions out on this. There's going to be some other um, new game mechanics with the Z-Power stuff they're bringing in. I don't know much about it, so I can't quite talk to it yet. But um, more or less looks to be like a normal Pokemon. Um, the cameras, I didn't play much of X and Y, so it kind of goes even more with the um, moving camera than what that one was. So it feels more like a standard video game, adventure game, than a, what Pokemon used to, but it still feels pretty good. Good, good. Well, uh, when mine arrives, I'll have to check that out. Uh, it's so good, so good. So, I think uh, we have a group question that we can all discuss. This group question comes to us from Orange Lounge Radio, uh, another fantastic gaming podcast. So, if you've got you know more gaming podcasts, you want to check out something a little different than us, uh, Orange Lounge Radio is fantastic, and they are the longest running video game podcast, and that is a fact. It's been over ten years, uh, so go check them out. Um, but the question is this. If you could live in any video game world of your choosing, which would it be and why? And I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this at at Ooh, Dan first. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's a tough one. Yeah, I thought this was a really good question. There's a, <laughs> a whole lot you can go into. I mean, do you want yeah, something yeah. action oriented where you're doing stuff? Do you want you know something? rather peaceful because i mean you're living here right this is your life yeah wow i mean probably just because i've been playing it a lot lately but <laughs> the witness is so beautiful if everything looked like that i wouldn't be mad about it that's true i it uh, might get a little lonely though yeah. very lonely yeah, it would it would get pretty lonely you can go hang out with some statues yeah, yeah. some really creepy statues <laughs> I think I think basically if I lived in the world of the witness, I would be Will Smith. Um, it, you know, I would dress up those mannequins and be like, "Sup, Greg? Statue man, how's it going? <laughs> what are you it doing out here, weird. Greg? What are you doing out here?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, uh, Eric, I don't know. I mean, there's some interesting things to look at. There's worlds like. Um, the whole um, fable 
oblivion style worlds where yeah. really you can get away and do whatever you want as long as you kill the people quick enough where they can't complain you can trick people to walk out their shops take what you need leave or you can be all nice and just you know go about your business kicking chickens all day yeah and if you're in skyrim you can just put a bucket over the shopkeeper's head and take whatever you want <laughs> but i think be none like the wiser the whole traditional <laughs> fantasy realm i think would have to be my pick I've I've been given this a lot of thought recently, and uh, I've got to say probably the the world of uh, Madden 1997 on the <laughs> PS1. I think life is a multicolored blob bouncing up and down. It's really it's carefree. You have no responsibilities, but you cheer. You're having a good time, right? Hey. So in in reality, what if more I had can to, you ask for? If I had to pick one. I love cyberpunk. I love the, the cyberpunk conspiracy realm, and I think the world of Deus Ex would be the one for me. Ooh. I thought you were going to go uh, Shadowrunner. Uh, oh, Shadowrun. Augmentation, though. Yeah, Shadowrun would be cool, too. <laughs> but Deus Ex specifically, because there's all the political intrigue, there's augmentations. Later on, uh, you know, in the timeline, there's, there's nanobots and nanomachines and... That is such a cool world. And no matter where you go, you've got an epic soundtrack back here. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think that's a good I think one. That would yeah, work. that's a good one. I like that one a lot. I'm going to give an honorable mention to the world of Perfect Dark because uh, <laughs> that, that would follow the same lines. Or, you know, you got like the whole Mario thing where you can actually become as big as you freaking want and just step on stuff. Yeah. That'd be cool too. Yeah, New World, my, my pick is Katamari Dimachi. Yes. I just want to roll all over everything and consume the world. <laughs> can, can I second that, but I'm like one of the guys that gets picked up and turned into a star? Yeah. I mean, yeah. imagine that fate. Imagine you're like, you're hanging there, you're at the market, you're like buying apples or something, and then all of a sudden you look down the street, you're just like, what the fuck is that? And then you get getting picked closer. Up, you can pick up by a giant rolling sticky ball that is presented to a, a cod piece wearing guy with this weird hat. And it's just like, yeah, that'll, this will make a nice star. You're like, wait, what? And he throws you into the sky and you explode into a fusion <laughs> cloud of a star. Meanwhile, he still yells at his son saying he's a failure and that he's not good enough doing what he's doing. Right. <laughs> For the record, <laughs> shittiest dad ever. <laughs> Oh, I missed that game. But just imagine you're seeing that. You start watching this little blob. Looks like an ant just rolling something. Then next thing you know, it looks like a little chihuahua rolling something. Then you got something that's about the size of a basketball. Then it turns the size of a beach ball. Next thing you know, this whole thing's swallowing fucking houses, islands, continents. (laughs) (laughs) All the while, an amazing, um, you know, the world is one, love everyone song is playing in the background. And no one feels bad that they're going to be rolled up and turned into a star and all life on Earth is destroyed by a giant sticky ball. You see, this is starting to make me think the best plant or best world to go would have been uh, Viva Pinata. That Dry, wouldn't be bad Colorful, either. and you um, breed animals that give you candy. Yeah, hang out mm. along the same lines, Harvest Moon. Right. If everyone you know lived on a farm, it's just like, oh, cool. My uncle gave me this farm. I'm going to go, you know, plant some eggplants or something over here and maybe raise a couple of chickens, get married, have a couple of kids. Well, it's I, not a bad well, life. I, I don't want to, the Pokemon uh, universe. Anybody? <laughs> that would be cool. And I didn't want to ruin Tom's dream, but you can go 50 miles from where you live and live that life, Tom. Just throwing that out <laughs> there. That is completely I possible. Can. <laughs> I can. But, uh, you know, I've, I've seen that. That looks like hard work. It's not like running around with your auto sprinkler or anything. It, that, that involves, like, manual labor. I don't know if I'm cut out for that. But, yeah, the world of Pokemon would actually be really cool. That'd be a good yes, one. it would. Because the whole concept of just find shit. Be- it's basically our world except there's Pokemon. So it's awesome. Well, it's, it's our <laughs> world except, you know, there's Pokemon. And at the age of 10, mm-hmm. I would have been like, Mom... I'm leaving. I'm going to be a Pokemon <laughs> master. You go, okay, sweetie, bye. Well, it's, and kick me out of the house. Well, it's like this perfect social society. I mean, look, you pay for the mark, but you walk into a Poke Center anywhere, you don't pay for anything, and it's all covered every time. But that's 
that's yeah. Pokemon healthcare, right? Yeah. That's socialized medicine for the vet. Yeah. What about if I break my arm in Viridian Forest? Do you think Metapod's going to help me? You think if I go up to Nurse Joy with my arm like all bent out of shape, she's going to be like, oh, <laughs> let me just sit you on this machine. You'll be better in a minute. Or what if they made the uh, Pokemon more realistic where you go to the Poke Center and you have to wait in a line for five and a half hours to get your Pokemon healed? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it turns Sorry, into man. a, um, a real, one of the real-time mobile app games where you build something and wait an hour. It's like, well, I want to kill yeah. my Charizard. I'll be able to battle again in two and a half days. Yet. You're giving them ideas, man. <laughs> then they're going to turn Pokemon into a Facebook game. You can buy oh. better insurance through the game to get faster times. It's perfect. Oh my god. Oh, yeah. That would be so bad. Why is Nintendo <laughs> not doing this? Easy money. Why haven't we made Just it? turn this off now before somebody gets wind of this. <laughs> All right, we're shutting off the podcast. We can't let this happen for the sake of Pokemon gamers everywhere. Keep Pokemon public, damn it. <laughs> so the uh, the world of, uh, of Elite Dangerous would be cooler. Any big space game, because oh. not only is there, like, giant space travel and space flight, but especially in Elite Dangerous, you know, if you want to ship, some company is just like, yeah, okay. It's not the best ship, but here's your ship, and now you have intergalactic spaceship. But you can go anywhere, do anything. Don't you kind of die in that game quite often? Yeah, but it's not so much dying, it's to, you though. eject, and then they're like, Tom, did you blow up your ship? Okay, <laughs> we're going to charge you like $60 here and give you a new one, but try not to do that again, okay? Or else it'll cost you another $60. That is a I, game the, the I death, enjoy. <laughs> the death in that game is... It's it's painful if you're not expecting it. Like if you drive your Mercedes off the lot and you've got like three bucks in your pocket, you're like, man, this is the best ship ever. And a pirate just tears you a new one and blows you up. Then you get the starter ship afterwards. Yes, it's painful. But the game tells you just flat out. They said, hey, there's insurance costs to everything you put on your ship. If you cannot afford it, do not fly it. Yeah, like I could live in that world or or. I think one for all of the accountants out there that listen to our show, <laughs> the world of EVE Online. You basically oh. live inside of an Excel spreadsheet for your entire life. <laughs> yeah, I don't the, the whole space thing would just be too lonely. I mean, you're never with people in those games. That's true. You're always in the That's ship true. by yourself in the middle of fucking nowhere shooting someone. Or yeah. worse yet, Someone needs some spices from across the galaxy for some <laughs> unforsaken reason, and they'll pay you four hundred thousand dollars to get some fucking capsaicin over in fucking next galaxy over. What is your purpose, <laughs> or what is my purpose? Uh, your purpose is to find spices over here and bring them over this way. Oh, oh my god! god. <laughs> that's that's basically that's elite dangerous in a nutshell. Yeah. Shout out so, season three starting soon. Everyone should watch it because that show is awesome. That's fantastic. Rick and Morty for those not, you know, second second reference. Seasoned. Yeah. So we have some gaming news. We don't have a ton. We're going to try to fly through it as fast as possible so we can get to our big topic of The Witness. Uh, but um, I, I think you mentioned, Eric, that uh, the PS4 Pro might be making some games slower. Yeah, What's so that about? It, slower. It's a little weird right now. Uh, the majority of the games that are marked as PS4 ready or PS4 Pro ready are running really well. Actually, better than most. It's um, There's a few games that are marked as PS4 ready that are seeing frame rate drops on uh, 1080p. Um, I'm trying to remember them off the top of my head. But I, the biggest one that I can remember was... Um, uh, the Last of Us Remastered, which was dropping up to five frames per second when it was running on the PS4 Pro. I'm sure they're going to patch it and get it fixed, but that was a um, PS exclusive, so it felt kind of weird for it. However, by and large, a, lot. a lot of the games like the Tomb, Mas or Tomb Raider and stuff like that, they're saying looks gorgeous. It is running really well, and a few games are expected to be able to run native 4K without checkerboarding like uh, Thumper. And some more of the simpler games right now. Mm -hmm. So, um, all in all, it's it's running pretty well. But a few of the games, weirdly enough, are performing poorly on the Pro compared to the regular PS4. 
Well, that's that's kind of to, to be expected. I mean, it's brand new technology. That's it's bleeding edge. Yeah, there's going to be some bugs here and there. But I'm the, sure they'll get it sorted out. The VR stuff has been. Um, I've heard the frame rates are running better. The tracking's not, but the frame rates and stuff for the things that have bumped are running pretty well. Right, and until we see some new VR hardware, yeah, right. that tracking, I'm sure. Yeah, that's always going to be a little bit of an issue. Then also, we had some uh, news on the new Switch. Um, I think, Tom, you said something about the prices on that one. Yeah, so it looks like, uh, now keep in mind, this is a leak. Um, it, it doesn't, you know, I didn't find any price tags on store shelves yet. Um, the Nintendo Switch, the core system, uh, will be 250 US dollars. Uh, but if you want a bit more storage and a pack-in game, which I love pack-in games, why did they ever stop that? I will have no idea. Um, will be three hundred. So uh, looks like another uh, low-priced, entry-priced uh, Nintendo system, uh, just like the Wii, Wii U, GameCube. I mean, go down the line; they've all been kind of lower priced, though it doesn't hurt you as much getting into it. At two fifty, I'm really interested, but I was also I felt this way about the Wii U. So we'll have to see where it shakes out. Um, I can't wait till the official prices come out. Um, I imagine they will be in this ballpark. One thing this does mean is that we're not going to get super super top of the line hardware. We're going to get something uh, pretty middling, pretty you know pedestrian. You assume unless Nintendo does a one eighty from their typical always ship with a profit, That's which true. Could, That's true. but. This is still lending out to worst case scenario. You're buying a um, mid tier tablet for a little extra money that's branded with Nintendo. Yeah. So we'll have to wait and see. And uh, Adam, I believe you heard something about uh, Nintendo having production issues. Yeah. Uh, fancy that with the NES that's... Classic. I actually had a coworker that was talking about how excited he was for the, the Nintendo Classic. And he was talking about, you know, he's got to go out and buy one. But he probably didn't buy one because they're having shortage issues. Typical Nintendo <laughs> Wait, fashion. Sold out day one. It's Nintendo <laughs> shortage issues? You have to be kidding me. Yeah. GameCube, Wii. Actually, the one con, I don't think they had the issue with the Wii U, did they? Um, I don't know. I don't think so. I know uh, the DS, 3DS, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance. I don't know if the Pocket did. I don't think the Pocket did. The Micro did. Um, I think the new DS is like the DS, um, 2XL. Yeah, that thing. I, I don't think that did, but you know, whenever Nintendo launches their, their first revision of brand new hardware, they always have this problem. Mm. And the, the cynic in me says this has got to be intentional. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, that, that theory gets me going. No one in the right mind would do that because yes, the idea is you short your supply it makes the price up. Demand. But the thing yeah. is, they're not making more money on shorter demands. The aftermarket is. Oh no, I, I don't think it's. I don't think it's driving the price up. They don't care about that. I think this is driving the news cycle up. Right? We're talking about it. Everyone else is talking about it. It, it does really good things for your product when you see sold out everywhere. Right? That's one of the big things yeah. that drove the Wii. Is that like, wow? This thing must be great. They're already gone. Exactly. You know, you couldn't get a Wii for, you know, a month after it launched and yeah. everyone was saying, wow, this must be the best thing ever because everyone is buying them. So yeah. you get these people that don't really know what they're getting into. They haven't done a lot of research. They have ad hoc evidence that it's just sold out. Everyone's buying them as fast as they can. And yeah, the eBay people make a bit of money on that. But, you know, yeah. by and large, Nintendo doesn't care. Yeah, they this, love the is, news cycle. this is something where I would debate flipping it because there's rumors of some being posted up to $300, which if wow. you're paying that for this, you're just, it's absurd. Yeah, yeah not this, your fault at that point. <laughs> this is nothing new. Nintendo's actually late to yeah. the game on this. You've had um, Atari's done this, Sega's done this. Nintendo's late to the game, but Nintendo's one of the best with the branding, so they made sure people yeah. knew it was coming out. Right. One game that's notably absent for licensing reasons uh, specifically is Tetris. Tetris is not on the NES Classic. Uh, they've got some great games on there, but I, Tetris is like this big gaping hole. They don't have it. Uh, and that's because Nintendo doesn't own the rights. It was one of the most popular games on their system, uh, but they don't own the rights to it. So it didn't make wow. it into the Classic. So uh, Nintendo did release a statement 
said the NES Classic Edition system is a hot item and we are working hard to keep it up with consumer demand. There will be a steady flow of additional systems through the holiday shopping season and un- into the new year. Please contact your local retailers to check product availability. And they have listed some retailers on the website. So here's the question. I don't think we've hey, actually even talked about this at all. Are either of you two interested in buying one? No. No, not really. You see, the price point's right to me, but I think they're doing it a little wrong. If they would tie this in to their uh, online store and let you actually add games to it, I think this would be an amazing device. Oh, yeah. I would buy this in a heartbeat if I could buy any S games. It's already been claimed this is not going to have any updates to it. This is not an online system. It's nothing like that. It is straight. Here is 30 games. Though, some people have already cracked it to boot, uh, boot up Ubuntu. So you know people are going to turn these into mass emulating machines. Yeah. And, you know, that's it's kind of, you know, par for the course with these, uh, you know, like the retro consoles being re-released in, in separate forms. I mean, none of them have the ability to be updated. Uh, Atari uh, in television, they keep re-releasing their console every year with, you know, more or different games. Uh, and you've just got to plug in the one you want to play. Um I'm sure Nintendo is going to have a, a Rev 2 out there. Maybe they'll jump straight to the Super Nintendo, but, uh, you know, it's it's kind of par for the course. And it keeps the price down for them, right? These are pennies on the dollar to produce. But the licensing cost, because these are not right. only first party. They do have third party games. Right. So we'll, we'll have to see. Um, for now, I'm happy with, uh, you know, running my, my ROMs through a computer with a controller. Um, I love to look at the hardware though. That hardware looks fantastic. If I could print a <laughs> Raspberry Pi case that looked exactly like that, I totally would. <laughs> so, uh, Eric, uh, I believe you have some news about EA, Twitch, uh, and the, uh, is it the FTC? Yes, the Federal Trade Commission. Um, yes. So, EA, uh, I don't understand if it was 100% they got under scrutiny or they're just making sure to not be put under the gun. Uh, They're implementing some new rules for uh, streamers and content providers that are not actually directly affiliated with EA. So they are now going to have two new watermarks and two new hashtags that streamers and YouTubers have to put on all of their reviews and videos. It is a hashtag supported by and a hashtag advertisement. Now, uh, what these are going to do is the hashtag supported by is saying that EA has somehow some way aided you in your ability to review this game whether it be they paid your flight to a trade show or something like that advertisement is telling you that ea had direct input on this review so therefore it should be viewed as advertisement and not an actual official review i like this i like this a lot yeah um i hope ea is not the only company that's being forced to do this Uh, that seems a little unfair to me um, specifically, I wish the FTC would target Bethesda in doing this. Um, well, uh, keep in mind, I this is something I want to stress because this is not n- normal for them. I don't believe this is EA being pressured. I think this is EA getting ahead of the curve and doing something. That would be great. Um, and, you know, EA has typically been known as one of the more evil of the, the classic video game companies. Um, but, you know, this this is a good thing. Uh, too long we've seen you know people on YouTube, people on Twitch uh, showing off, reviewing, uh, you know whether they're they're actually having a good time or faking having a good time doing let's plays of various games by various companies. They may or may not be getting paid to do that, and there have been certain uh, high profile instances of you know YouTubers or Twitch streamers being paid by a company to show off a certain game or a certain series of games, and the CS:GO this gambling help. circle. Yeah, that's absolutely huge. Those uh, For those who are not familiar, uh, CSGO has this uh, roulette system where you can win items in game. You put in a game uh, item of such money, you get such odds. And um, this was advertised, well, it's now considered advertisement, before it was shown by people, quote unquote, randomly playing and actually winning 15000 or so dollars worth of um, items for CSGO, which could be cashed out comes to find out that these guys in these videos making these winnings are affiliated with the site themselves right it's it's just plain and simple corruption um it's 
it's not a good thing. And in the FTC rules, um, you know, EA getting getting hooked up with this, that's great. Um, because, you know, you can now go into a review that says sponsored by or advertised, uh, knowing that there's bias there. Um, it's still worthwhile content. You can still watch it, uh, mm -hmm. but you know that it's not going to be impartial. Uh, supported by, I don't think you have to worry about it so much because that's kind of typical. You get flown out to check out a game, something like that. The sponsored it, it, it by, depends. the sponsored by is the bad one because EA yeah. is looking at this review and critiquing it. Right. right. I even think supported by could be bad. I mean, even Valve banned, you know, um, well, banned. They they pushed off the reviews where the developer gave the, the person the game for free into a separate section that's not shown by default. So that could be, you know, uh, supported by um, EA. If somebody said, hey, hey, look, we've got this great game, Battlefield 1, and we're going to give it to you high-profile, you know, Twitch stars. Go and play it for us, okay? Um, that, depending on the Twitch star, depending on, you know, their level of comfort, whether or not that happens all the time, you know, I know... Uh, you know, some people might be swayed by that. I mean, it could be gray, but I mean, this also goes for your big guys. This goes for IGN. This goes for Bombcast. Yeah. This goes for GI. I mean, it goes for the big guys, too. And on those guys, yeah. if it says sponsored by, I'm not concerned. Because they, on the regular, get review copies, get sent out to trade shows and all that. Right, right. And that's why they're in that position. They, they do this stuff all the time, and most of them are professionals. And then I think that's pretty much it for the news that we had this week. It was kind of a light week on the cycle. Um, there was two pretty noticeable releases in my eyes anyway. Um, we had the Pokemon Sun and Moon. And then um, we had this. Are any of you two familiar with a game called Roller Coaster Tycoon? What? Yes. I've never heard of it. <laughs> so, um, I want to get up this combined oh, wild Eric, ride. funny story. I have your Roller Coaster Tycoon 2 disc. You got that? I have it. The game has been I don't know MIA. how I have it. I don't know how I have it. I don't remember having it, but I have it. <laughs> <laughs> I've never played it, but I have it. <laughs> and actually, it's funny you point out Roller Coaster Tycoon 2. Because, um, so this game, Planet Coaster, is produced by uh, Frontier Development. Frontier Development is the same team that brought you Roller Coaster Tycoon 2 and 3. But due to licensing issues with Atari, they can no longer work on Roller Coaster Tycoon. Hence, its spiritual successor, Planet Coaster. The first AKA Roller Coaster, Coaster Tycoon Roller 4. Roller Coaster Tycoon 4, yeah. Um, the first day, it had over 1,000 reviews on Steam, and it was um, overwhelmingly positive. At this point, it's over 2,000, and it's sitting at very positive. So this game is getting great reception. Yeah, it looks good, too. I was watching a, a little bit on Twitch earlier today. Um, it looks really nice. It kind of looks like... Um, it reminded me a little bit of City Skylines a little bit. I don't know why, but like yeah. just it's probably just just the it's a sim game, yeah. But and um, but awesome. you've you've got all the, the sliders. You can yeah. you can control you know how much salt you throw on the French fries, a la you know sim theme park <laughs> and stuff like that. So hopefully uh, they fix the uh, swarming behavior of the people. I remember in the original Orchestra Tycoon, if you put more than a one path block they would get lost in the park because they would just start walking circles sometimes in the middle of like a multi-path block <laughs> or block path. But um, it was also, they did work on one other noticeable game that they self-produced. And I know you're familiar with it, Tom. Elite. Yes. This is the same development group oh, that Frontier. brought you Elite Dangerous. Right. Yeah, oh, Frontier. Wow. You wouldn't think of it because you think Roller Coaster Tycoon yeah. and Elite Dangerous, two different ball games, but... Right. Yeah. So, yeah, that's pretty exciting release. Um, $44 on Steam. I will probably not be picking it up until the holiday sale where they probably knock 10% off. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this on my you know, secondary wish list of, hey, if I find it for 5 bucks in a super you know, bargain bin sale, I'll pick it up. But <laughs> with, with these games, I haven't, I haven't ever put that much time into them. Oh, right? yeah. The Roller Coaster Tech great but i could never put more than 20 hours into one i could put 20 hours in a weekend easy i <laughs> love sim based games wow yeah i mean hell factorio i got a 50 hour factory going right now 
Okay. But um, I will say, if you haven't, if you need a SimCity esque fix, uh, and you know that SimCity is utter shit right now, um, City Skylines absolutely fantastic. Uh, since Adam mentioned that, so if you are in the need for a city builder, go get that. It's great. Um, big note: uh, watch your streets because that will make you want to quit a city faster than anything. <laughs> oh yeah, the traffic. Get the oh, traffic man. done. Get it city is perfect except for the traffic which is just killing it it is it is basically my my entire growth has leveled off because people can't get in or out of my city it is a train wreck uh, okay so all right, should we get down to the meat of things yeah i was we just ready to we, say there's one I'm, game we've all been playing i'm excited for this the witness and you should be oh, jonathan blow also known as guy who made braid this game also, is really good. It's not exactly new, but that's what we've been playing recently. A lot. A lot. So, this game, and I'm going to say this, and it will sell it as short as you can sell this game. The entire purpose of the game is to draw lines in a grid. That is it. That is the only thing you will do <laughs> in this entire game is draw lines. In a, oh. Now, now. Adam, attack him. Please. Attack him, please, Adam. Please, um, please. I'm holding Buy back. I'm holding game. back. <laughs> Buy this game. It is not like it sounds. I know, like, if, if you've jumped into um, one of our 72 PC witness streams recently, you have seen me staring at the, at the screen in disgust with myself because I'm too stupid to draw a line properly. Um, <laughs> it's, it's absolutely dependent on the environment it makes you think, it makes you question your assumptions, it teaches you things without words or tutorials or pictures. Uh, it is one of the best immersive puzzle games I have played in years. It's kind of funny you say that it teaches you to play without words, because in actuality what this game is doing is teaching you a language. This is a very Pretty distinct much, yeah. puzzle language that you are learning throughout this game. By the time it's done, you'll be able to put together hundreds of combinations of puzzles in one big puzzle. It is language building, only with a puzzle foundation rather than actual vocabulary. Yeah. So how it works is you'll, you'll get to a place and you'll find a, a puzzle. Uh, a lot of the times it's like a, a row of, of these puzzles. And each of them is like a panel with lines on it. And then you might see a symbol you've never seen before. But the first one is always easy. You know, you, you draw the line away. Oh, that doesn't work. So you draw a line a certain way. Okay, that works. Why does that work? And what does that symbol mean? You do the next one. It builds onto that. And it, it kind of gradually uh, teaches you what that symbol does and how it works. And then later on, they'll you'll get to a place and you'll see a new symbol. Like, well, what does that do? And the same thing happens. And you're using both of those symbols together in places and so on and so forth. It's like all this in um, language building when you're a kid. You see a ball everything's a ball and then you realize oh this ball goes into this hoop oh it's a different type of ball and it's like oh this ball gets thrown at someone with a stick it's a different type of ball and yeah. they like adam's saying they always start you off simplistic to the point where you only have two options you miss it once and you get it right mm -hmm. but and tom the... it is not just a grid drawing game i will throw this out there yeah there are other things this... that being said I've never been more riveted drawing a line on a grid before. Yes, very much. I know, right? I know. And I, I don't want to sell this game short. I don't yeah. want to tell people that, you know, I hate it because I love this game. Yeah, it, it's 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 a very ambitious game. There is a lot to do. There is a lot to figure out. Uh, there's some meta game to it. You're going to be writing things down for later. Um, if anybody's played Fez, it's a lot like that as far as how big the the puzzles go or how deep it goes uh, there was a point and click uh, adventure got... called mist that if anyone looks it up you will yes. see that this that's definitely where this game spiritually derived from yeah. um it was a point and click puzzle you're stranded on an island game granted from everything i've heard these puzzles are not a no. not as straightforward no. as some of these but others not nearly as deep <laughs> as some of these yeah. <laughs> well, you're, you're putting it lightly. I'm a huge Mist fan. Um, Mist is not intuitive at all. Uh, it has got some of the some of the big problems with classic adventure games, where you know there's a there's some pixel hunting, there's some 
really that works why does that work i don't know why that works uh, some of this stuff gets a little better in the later games but uh mist is by by no means even on this same level the witness goes out of its way with the little you know tutorial strips of grids to say here's what we're trying to teach you without coming out and saying these are the rules yeah um mist never did anything like that mist would show you you know one machine for one puzzle and it would work in that one way and you would never see it again it would just be mm -hmm. gone after you completed that one puzzle they'd throw it away you never i won't say never you hardly ever carried over concepts in mist but as far as the island goes as far as how giant it is and how certain things aren't really what they seem the witness definitely takes heavily from that mm-hmm uh, it's something you kind of mentioned there, but a huge point for this that I like is the game. And this is uh, Jonathan Blow actually had a couple of videos on this where he talks about this. The game respects you as a player and your intelligence. There is no tutorial. There is no, hey, this button does this, or this is how this puzzle works in text writing. Okay, now you try. It is, you're 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 in the island, you see something, and either you figure it out or you don't. If you figure it out you can keep going if you don't you can walk somewhere else and you know try again somewhere else uh there's no there's no hand holding and that really was really like, important for my enjoyment of this yeah i really like the the physical manifestation of puzzles it's not mm -hmm. like other puzzle games that are linear where you know i'm on i'm on stage 97 so yeah yeah i can't beat stage 97 so i'm gonna walk away and try stage 97 again in a little bit you can certainly play the witness like that but i haven't been every time i've gotten frustrated or annoyed with a puzzle where i look at it and i go oh not this thing okay i'm just gonna come back to it later i'll go to another part of the island and try something else completely different out uh, yeah. And then a lot of the time, I'll learn something. I'll be like, huh, I never thought about the puzzle I was stuck on in that other way after completing another area. I've never felt truly stuck in the yeah. witness. I felt stuck in places, but mm -hmm. I just leave that place and go to another one. Yeah. That, that ability I think that's really to, important, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I never felt like I had to stop playing the witness because I couldn't go any further. Yeah. And a lot of games have that feeling. And you hinted something I really like. It's the idea that there's multiple types of puzzles. And they all tie to a particular biome in the island. Every kind yeah, of puzzle will kinda. go to a, its own biome. I mean, it's not always like desert water kind of biome. But, I mean, it could be as different as there's a certain type of tree that grows in this area and it has this type of puzzle. Or you're in this building and all these types of puzzles are in this building. So, I mean, you it's a distinct feel to a location with the certain type of puzzle that you're doing as well. Because I think the atmosphere of this game is a huge selling point. You can just walk around and just observe things. It's just such a beautiful landscape. And it's not that it's like ultra realistic. It's just very vibrant popping colors that just mm -hmm. are very pleasing to look at. Yeah, the art oh, yeah. direction is, is excellent in this game. Um, it's, it's not, it's not cell shaded but it's got that kind of cartoony... Uh, I don't even want to say low polygon either, but it's got those those flat kind of pastel almost colors to it. Very, very vibrant, very unique looking. Um, very it's it's gorgeous correct. to walk around in. Yeah. yeah. And I was actually reading an interview where a blow on this, he ended up taking more of a game direction side or directive side and didn't really get hands on with a lot of stuff. And he credited mm -hmm. an intern that they brought in early in the process for pretty much the entire game because of the art that they had one uh, artist come in that pretty much laid down the foundation for the entire game with all those colors and the way the trees look. He's like, the game was in place. It just wasn't pretty. And this yeah. person came in and just made it, made the game. He, he pretty much credited the feel of the game to the success of the game. That, that's, that's, a, that's a huge part of the game, too. Uh, even if you're not solving puzzles, if you're walking around and looking at things and exploring, that's enjoyable in itself. It's it's relaxing. Uh, I, I like I like how I the, it's got a sense of wonder to it. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> which is which is something I want to touch on here in a bit. But I I love how in the witness there's the focus on the central mechanic. No matter what you're doing, if you're opening doors, if you're managing a switch. You are drawing a line on a box of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are places in the witness where, you know, they could have given you 
uh, typical WASD controls to control something, or they could have given you a button to press, but they didn't. They they focused on this one mechanic and this one aesthetic of there's some sort of you know four sided parallelogram here where you have to draw a line to do something. And even in simple interactions where you're not solving a puzzle, you're mm -hmm. still using that mechanic. And it, it really mm -hmm. makes the game feel complete. Nothing feels half-baked. Nothing feels like um, like the short differences of kind that you would get in a game like Call of Duty, where, hey, we're going to show you this cool, really awesome set piece. You're going to use it for like six and a half minutes. We're going to move on, and you're <laughs> never going to see that thing again. So enjoy that while it lasts, because it's never coming back, and you'll never see it again. The Witness does the exact opposite, where they say, hey, look, you learned this concept. You're going to learn it everywhere. So remember it. Yeah. So I, the game's three years old. I feel kind of conf actually four years old, I think. Three? Four. Either way. I'm kind of comfortable asking this kind of question. Have I know Adam has Tom? Have you found any um, hexagonal puzzle like solutions on a map that you had no idea what to do with yet? No, not yet. There okay. is an area to this game that when you see it, it'll just it feels out of place, but then you'll stay there for a half hour, just standing there watching something, just like you'll just look around and stand there. Oh. Mm -hmm. there's lots so, of little secrets to find too one of the things um, I've, I've found a couple there's tape recorders but mm -hmm. it, it kind of it reminds me of Braid in a way mm -hmm. um, sort of but even Braid was cohesive at the end um, yeah. these little tape recorders ha are they've got various people's voices on them some people are quoting other people um, like there's a quote by Albert Einstein on one of the tape recorders. Some guy is just talking about his experience with one thing that doesn't really pertain to anything except the place you're in. Yeah, I, I've never found a single thread. And granted, I'm not too far into the game, but I haven't found the single story thread that ties this all together. I don't know if The Witness has a story at this point. I know it has to because all of the pieces are there. I just don't know how they're connected. And that might be a puzzle in and of itself, is how does this story fit together? Braid was the same way. Braid wasn't, hey, here's a guy and a princess and a thing, and that makes sense, right? Braid, you had to kind of piece together this weird disjointed story to make sense of it. I feel like The Witness is trying to do that, but I haven't seen it yet. Have you been on top of the mountain? No. I'm kind of... Um, tell me how you feel about this item because I'm pretty sure you've explored around a good bit too I'm kind of in the feel where I think it might be a science versus religion kind of undertone to it I I don't know I haven't gotten that far into the, the story bits I haven't found a whole lot of tape recorders yet um, I found a couple of them um, a couple of the hexagonal maps made me believe mm -hmm. that and then also up top there are some statues up there that make me kind of think that yeah there I'm are, sure there's some, if not a story, at least some sort of working message. I'm sure there's something. Yeah, there. The first time, and so the witness, you are utterly alone on this island, from what I understand. I haven't seen another living thing. I've heard birds and trees. <clears throat> I haven't seen one. Um, but the first time you see a statue, it will freak you the fuck out. Because <laughs> it did me. I opened this door and there was a dude there, and I was like, ah, I don't have any <laughs> weapons. Like, draw lines on you, fear me. And the guy just stood there. I'm like, oh, it's not a guy, it's a statue. And these things are fucking everywhere. And they never stop being slightly creepy or slightly off. <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be witnessing, but something happened here. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting the first time you see one for sure um that really puts a eerie feel to a couple of areas that you walk into and it feels like a city and then there's yeah. oh, just yeah. populations are statues i just really couldn't get past that a couple of times like the um there's a broken house maze where the first time I got there, I couldn't find the mace. I just kept looking around at all these people. And I didn't know how to get into this house because I just kept getting sidebarred by walking to a statue. What the hell is this guy doing? What's this guy doing? And, I mean, some of this stuff makes... 
at least to me initially makes no sense there's you know some people off doing this thing and other people over here like fencing and another guy it's like taking out trash or something some guy smoking a cigar like no one's connected that i've seen mm-hmm. um i you know there are very few statues where they're actually interacting with each other but usually it's a single set piece that has nothing to do with anything else that I've been able to find. But The Witness is the type of game where you have to question that. Usually you're just like, ah, oh, that's kind of weird, and you walk away, right? But not The Witness, because you quickly learn that literally every single object, every single sound, every single tree has been put exactly where it's <laughs> supposed to go. It has been deliberately placed just like I was talking about on the previous episode where, um, you know, one of the puzzles, I solved it by brute forcing it. And I said, wait, I have to step back and actually learn the solution here. You know, each of those trees were not random. Nothing in this game is random. The sound effects you hear, those aren't random. You know, sometimes they don't mean anything to the particular puzzle you're working on. Sometimes they're the entire point of the puzzle you're working on. Uh, everything in this game that I've seen is very deliberate in the way they're building it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm trying to draw invisible threads through everything. I feel like this this crazy conspiracy theorist where I'm like, these textures, man, there's like a burn thing here on the ground. I know it's not <laughs> there's no puzzle here, but it's got to mean something, man. It's the man, yeah. man, the witness man. <laughs> Tom just went big Lebowski on us. Yeah. <laughs> I really, I want to take Jonathan Blow and like shove him up against the wall and say, what is this? What is the meaning of this? You have tell to us. tell me. <laughs> but but uh, then I, I'd miss out. Yeah. Then I wouldn't be able to finish it myself. Yeah. Um, I think worth mentioning because we've talked about, we've talked about how there's one mechanic. You're drawing lines on these, these grids, but it's, it's more than that though. Like without spoiling too much, there's a whole lot of creative ways that they they implement that it's not just learning the symbols that are on the board there's a lot more to it some of them might have to do with the environment in some way yeah i think the best thing to say to not lead people directly into it is just go explore on top of the mountain and you'll understand 100 percent what adam's talking about yeah look look around you you really have to think outside of the box or think outside of the grid if you will (laughs) Hey, I did there. Just like with Jonathan Blow's other game, Braid. You know, someone says, "Oh, it's it's Mario Brothers, but you can go back in time." Okay, cool. Yeah. That, that sounds <laughs> awesome in and of itself, yeah. but that's not the whole game. It's not even yeah. close to the whole game because yeah. sometimes things won't be affected by time. Sometimes you've got like a time bubble where things are slower than things outside the bubble. Sometimes you can create a weird copy of yourself. Sometimes time. Uh, is mapped to the x-axis in the level you're in like it gets insane and the witness does that exact same thing i'm not just you know drawing lines and finishing up mazes i'm doing weird things that make no sense if anyone hasn't played or watched this game before disclaimer there is no killing of things in time travel to avoid your own death in the witness (laughs) yeah no totally different (laughs) But I They're both do, puzzle games, but <laughs> I do like that about the witness where it's a very chill, passive it's so game. Relaxing. You don't it's... die. You're not raced in time. Well, there's mm-hmm. actually one spot where you're kinda of racing time. But there's no like actual <laughs> hard time limit to the game. There is right. no you don't get it by this amount of time you lose. There is no end game scenario where you can't beat it. You just It's the only of... game I've played that I can simultaneously work the hell out of my brain and also wind down and relax. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is one of I, I have been making the witness. It's so peaceful. Cool. Yeah, Snack, it's so peaceful. Cup of tea, knock out a few puzzles here and there. I'm in no rush. I've got no yeah. timer. There's no mm-hmm. enemies or stuff to worry about. I sit back. Maybe, maybe sometimes I'll put on like some ambient tunes just just to get the air moving a little bit. Tom puts on it some Kenny so G. Puts I do. On, man. You know, his, uh... I turn down the lights a little bit. Things get a little romantic. It's amazing. Just <laughs> and the creation of Jonathan Blow, just sitting there sharing our evening, man. Yes. It's about. We're gonna get you a big giant cardboard cutout of him. For- <laughs> I think that's his new man crush. I don't know who he has more, Jonathan Blow or uh, Gabe. Well, in in previous iterations of the seventy two pin connector podcast, I was uh, I was blasted several times for basically worshiping Braid. 
uh, and I still do to this day. I think Braid uh, and The Witness are some of the most impressive puzzle games I have played ever. Uh, and, and Jonathan Blow is a god. He's a very smart man. So the question is, when will he ever strike again? Oh, I can't wait. I mean, this game's I, old. He what? was working on this a long time, too. And it shows. It absolutely shows. But I wouldn't necessarily expect something soon. Well, they <laughs> formed an actual game development company for this game. Right. Yeah, yeah, true. They had uh, fun, uh, crowd or crowdsourced eight hundred thousand dollars early or for uh, backers for mm -hmm. the production of this. But yeah, yes. I can't wait. Uh, but regardless of how long we have to wait, you can be guaranteed to hear about it here first on the seventy two bit connect <laughs> podcast. Or at least when we first get back. Yeah. So I, I think I think that's about all I had to say about the witness. Um, I think after this, I'm gonna make some coffee, chill out, turn the lights down low, put on some Kenny G, and do the <laughs> coffee and blow stream right here on this channel. Yeah, I'll probably join you, hang out in the the thing a little bit, play some more of that. I haven't Sweet. played it today or yesterday, so that doesn't sound but, too uh, bad. I have uh, I have a gaming fact for you guys actually. Oh, what you got? Oh, Tom, you're gonna like this one. Half-Life is the first game in the series released on November 19th, 1998. Yes! It's half Half-Life birthday day. <laughs> and, Eric, uh, did you ever Half-Life? It's a sin. I've only played a little bit of Black Mesa. Yeah, I play the same. I played a little bit of Black Mesa. That's it. Okay. But it was well, good. It was good. If you, if you play through Black Mesa all the way, then, then I will count that. It um, will happen eventually. If you haven't, Black Mesa is a free mod, but you can help out and support the modding community by buying the game on Steam. Uh, it's not officially licensed by Valve, but it is blessed by them. So uh, if you want an updated version of Half-Life 1, go grab that. It's on their damn game platform. I don't think you can yeah. get too much more endorsement other than actually Valve <laughs> saying we're going to publish it for you. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's awesome. And in Half-Life, Half-Life changed everything. But one of my favorite games of all time. Well, I think that's going to be it for us this week. You guys can all get at us at fanmail at 72pinconnector.com with any questions or things. remarks that you would like us to talk about or consider. Uh, questions, can, all that, send it. Yeah, we can answer them on stream or anything. You can tweet at us at, at 72pcpodcast. You can look us up at YouTube. If you can't find this live, you'll find us at 72pinconnector at YouTube. Or if you want to watch us live Fridays at 10 p.m. Eastern, you can find us at 72 pin connect or dot TV slash 72 pin connector on Twitch. And I think that's about all the platforms we use. 72 pin connector dot com. Ah, yes. I just, the oh, website. Man. And um, for us, I think that's all we got. So until next week, game on. See you, everyone. See ya.